All right, Marriage Prep 101, getting ready for the big day, lesson seven. This is um, the four A's of a successful marriage, uh, part one. I've broken this uh, lesson into two parts. So we, you know, we've gone through the, uh, some of the ideas, some of the lessons that uh, we'd love for people to know before they get married. Uh, now we're moving into uh, lessons and some information about marriage itself when you already are married and some of the things that uh, we can contribute to uh, our relationships to uh, improve them. Uh, no matter uh, what uh, culture you belong to, it doesn't matter what religion you believe, it doesn't matter what society you're part of, it doesn't matter the level of your wealth. It doesn't even matter the era that you live in. One thing common to all people is everybody wants to be happy, especially in their marriages. That is universal. It doesn't matter. People who don't believe in God, they want to be happy when they marry. People who fervently believe in God, they want to be happy in their marriage. Hindus want to be happy in their marriage. Muslims want to be, you know, everybody wants to be happy in marriage. Um, as I say, everybody wants this, even in different cultures, this is what people want. They want happiness in their marriage. I've never heard a new bride or a groom rub their hands together and say, man, I can't wait for the divorce. Now we've experienced the wedding. Yeah, well, I wonder what the divorce will be like. Nobody thinks that, nobody, of course not. Even if your son or your daughter marries the sorriest loser, even if your son or daughter you know, gets the worst match possible as far as your eyes are, you know, in your eyes are concerned, what do parents end up saying anyways? Well, I hope they'll be happy. You know, even though in the back of their mind they're thinking, man. <laughs> Reminds me of the old joke, uh, behind every successful man there stands a very surprised mother-in-law. But I mean, it's a very old joke. <laughs> so why do, we, why do we desperately want to be happy in marriage? That's really the question, the setup. Why do we want that? It, it seems normal, but why? A couple of reasons. Because this relationship, marriage, has the power to make us extremely happy or extremely sad. I mean, this relationship affects everything else in our lives, so of course we want to be happy in it. And of course, parents want their children to be happy in marriage because they've lived a while and they understand how marriage impacts everything that happens in your life. So of course they want their children to be happy in marriage. Of course they're stressed out that their child marries the right person because they know the impact that marriage has on a person's life. We want to be happy in marriage because we often measure our success in life by how well we succeed in our marriage. Many times we use marriage um, to give value to ourselves. I married well, I didn't marry well. You know. We want to be happy in marriage because we don't, get e we don't get many chances to get it right. I mean, some people don't get any chance. You know, people who have never married, you know, they, it's not that they didn't want to, it just, it, <laughs> It never happened for them. Wrong time, wrong place, wrong person. I mean, you just asked a you know, middle-aged divorced woman with three kids how easy it is to find someone to marry. It's not an easy thing to find someone that you want to spend your life with. And of course, there's so much pressure on us to succeed. Everybody, you know, our parents want us to marry well. Uh, children, our religious uh, beliefs, you know, point us towards a happy marriage, society in general, our work, our career. 
Everybody is hurt or disappointed if we fail. Try going to work and telling your boss, hey, you know, I was in divorce court and you know, I'm, you know, my, my wife left me. You think he's going to be thinking in his mind, wow, this is a guy I'm going to have to watch. I'm going to have to promote this guy. Yeah, no. You, know, you fail at marriage. It's not just marriage where it hurts you. It hurts you everywhere. And of course, many people want to duplicate the happiness and the level of contentment that they saw perhaps in their parents' marriage or in their grandparents' marriage. They see this as an ideal. Ah, oh, my grandma and grandpa, you know, they were married 60 years, and they look so happy and everything, and yeah, that's what I want. And we see that as a goal somehow. Or people want to be happy in marriage because they've been unhappy growing up, or they've been unhappy as single persons. And they think, well, if I get married, finally I'm going to be happy. And I've, you know, I've talked to you about that. If you don't know how to be happy as a single person, just getting married doesn't automatically make you happy. People want to experience something that they've missed out on at times. And they hope that marriage will supply that. And in many cases, it does but there's great expectation to succeed, a lot of pressure. And then finally, because they've been told that they will be happy and they should be happy when they marry the one that they love. As I say, there's a great expectation of happiness. We had this big wedding, everybody was there, you got lots of gifts, you know. You're young, you're both healthy, therefore you should just automatically always be happy. And so we buy into this thing, we, you know, we, we, we take that as cash money and we think, yeah, I should always be happy. And for all of this expectation and hope of happiness in marriage, there is a sad reality that many couples do not attain this prize they so covet when they say, I do. They had the big wedding, everything was supposed to be right, uh, you know, and four years down the line, I'm miserable. <laughs> what happened? According to a survey done on couples here in North America trying to determine the level of success in marriage, the following picture emerged. 50% said they couldn't resolve issues and ended up divorcing. So we know that, that we know the divorce rate in this country is you know, one in two, roughly. 25% acknowledged that their marriage was based on convenience. We have the kids, we have no choice, we're in debt, uh, we're too proud, uh, we can't divorce because our religion says it's a sin. So we just, we just stick it out. 15% of respondents said that they were generally satisfied in their marriage. Yeah, we're good to go. 10% answered the survey by saying they were very happy. They wouldn't change a thing. Although 100% of people you know, want a happy marriage, the actual number of people who actually accomplish this is lower than that. Of course, this particular survey did not focus on Christian marriages where I suspect the numbers of happiness would be higher and the number of divorce rate would be lower. And we talked about that in, a, in, another, um, in another class. The point I'm trying to make is that uh, the expectation is if 100 people, 100 couples get married, 100 couples should always be happy. Uh, no, that's, that's not how it works. In any case, I do believe that God wants everyone to have a successful, a successful marriage, especially Christians. You know, there's another series that I do that's entitled In Love for Life. And uh, the point I make in that particular series in the beginning is if God made marriage for life, then He also provided the resources that we remain in love for life. We don't have a God that says, okay, here's the rule. You, you, once you get married, you got to stay married for your whole life, but all I'm going to do is give you just enough tools so that you can be happy for five or six years. After that, you're on your own. That's not the God that we, that's not the God that we serve. 
If he establishes marriage for life, then he also provides the resources that we can be happy for life. I don't mean no trouble, no sickness, you know, no, no bumps in the road. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, God also provides the resources for us to attain happiness and satisfaction in that marriage for a lifetime. Otherwise, he would not have mandated that it lasts a lifetime. He would have said, okay, marriage, five years. <laughs> five years, every five years, like, it's like a football coach. You know, every couple of years, you renew your contract. But that's not, that's not how it works, is it? Now, in a previous session, we talked about the changes that take place when you go from being single to dating or, or even engaged to being legally married very quickly. I said that a new legal status begins. You have a new union recognized by law and society. It's the highest commitment a couple can make before God. When I have a, not a debate, but a discussion with a couple, especially in Quebec, where we come from, more people live together without marriage than actual people who are actually married in, in society. You know. uh, and, and, and they say, well, we got the same thing, just that piece of paper, it doesn't mean anything different. No, 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 I tell them. I said, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying, uh, you people who live together but you're not married, I'm not saying you don't love each other, uh, of course not. I'm not even saying you're not kind of committed to each other. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is you have not made the highest commitment possible that one person can make to another in our society. That's marriage, where whether you believe in God or not, you go before the law and say, this union we will now bind under law. That's the highest commitment that you can make in society. And it's the highest commitment that you can make before before God. So when you get married, a new legal status begins. A new relationship begins. You are now part of an exclusive lifetime relationship. A, 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 a relationship that you have with no one else. And no one else ever asks you that. No boss that you go for a job says, okay, you got to sign a lifetime contract that you're going to be with you know, XYZ company. No boss will ever ask you that. But your marriage partner does. No friend ever says, hey, we're, you're friends, we're you know, BFF forever, we're best friends forever. You, you need to sign up and say, you'll be my best friend and have no other best friends. Well, no. Only in marriage do you have a contract that says, I'm with you and you're with me and we're exclusive, 100% exclusive and for life. That's the only contract like that that, that, that we ever sign. A new identity begins. You're going to be referred to as a couple from now on, not as an individual. A new role begins. You'll now take responsibilities that you didn't have before. You'll be a husband or a wife or a father, or a mother. And a new family uh, begins. You leave your old family to begin a new one and the new one takes precedence. And we talked about that last time. So when people marry and organize a wedding ceremony and all of the associated activities, what they're doing is symbolizing with vows and rings and songs and prayers and celebrations, they're symbolizing all the changes that are about to take place as they marry and the anticipation of the happiness that they will experience. And here's the point I want to make the happiness that they will experience as a result of these changes. Where does the happiness come from? It comes from these changes. This is my point. You're wondering, how am I going to be happy? You know, some people think they have to repeat the activities of the wedding. You know, different type of food, different type, you know, gift exchanges. Uh, let's go on a third honeymoon. Let's do this and that. They're trying to find the happiness. But the happiness comes from these things here. These things are the things that produce the happiness. The new legal status, the new relationship, the new identity, the new role, the new family. That, that's the wellspring of the happiness. So this new exclusive lifetime commitment that brings a new role in identity and family, this is the source of the happiness that everyone seeks in marriage. So therefore, conversely, when people are unhappy in marriage, 
It is in these areas that the root of their problems lie. Where does the counselor, what is he, look, he or she looking for when a couple goes, like a couple comes to see me for marriage counseling? Where do I look? You know, if I was a mechanic, where would I be looking for the trouble? Well, I'd be looking in those areas. Because those are the areas that create the happiness. So therefore, the same areas are the ones that create the friction and the trouble. For example, perhaps there is a doubt or there's a violation of the exclusivity of one's relationship, or there's a wavering as to the length or the quality of one's commitment. All of a sudden, one partner begins to kind of suspect that their partner isn't as committed to this relationship as they thought. It might be true, but it might only be a suspicious, a, a suspicion. You know, in a, in a thousand little ways, you're thinking, well, I don't know if he's as committed to this as I am. And then all of a sudden, well, if, if you're not as committed as I am, I'm not going to be committed. I'm not going to go all out for this thing. And pretty soon we start drifting apart and we have commitment issues and we're not talking. And Perhaps one or both partners are confused about their married identities and roles that, that they are to play. You know, men especially have trouble transitioning from the bachelor role to the husband role. You don't take on a wife as a hobby. <laughs> I got this extra thing. You know, I got married last week, I got this extra thing. I have a wife now, I got this extra thing. But I'll be there Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday for bowling practice. <laughs> you know, I'll just work the marriage around that. <laughs> yeah. We don't sometimes understand what getting married means. It doesn't mean I don't go bowling anymore, but it means that bowling and winning the bowling championship is no longer my first priority. She's my first priority. I remember once I was, uh, I was applying for a job as a, as a minister, long, long time ago, and I had to meet with, you know, it's the typical thing, you meet with the elders and they get together, and sometimes the elders and some of the deacons, and you, you, it's a group meeting. You're sitting there, sometimes with or without, and this time I was with Lise, my wife, and they were kind of peppering me with questions, you know, what do you think about this? And what would you do in that situation? What's your favorite, what, would you, what book did you read last? And if this happened in the church, how would you react? And you know, just, it's all right, it's normal. It's the way you interview a preacher to find out what he thinks and what, you know, what he does. And so, you know, they've asked me a lot of questions and Lise is just sitting quietly listening, you know, <clears throat> and they look at her and they say, and all of a sudden someone looks at her and they said, and what's your ministry? Because in a lot of churches they think, you know, you get two for the price of one. You know, you get your wife, she's in, she'll take over the ladies ministry and this and that and blah, blah, blah. You know. So they looked at Lise and they say, what's your ministry? And she, she didn't skip a beat. <laughs> she pointed at me and she said, he's my ministry. That was the end of that discussion. <laughs> he's my ministry. I'm not in charge of the women and I'm not in charge of the kids and I'm not in charge of anything. My ministry is him and what comes from he and I, which means our children and our, and our home. Lise has always understood the role that she plays in our relationship, in our ministry, in our partnership, you know. But sometimes we're confused about that and that causes trouble. Perhaps the burden of family is frightening or too heavy, and this is causing hesitation and conflict or doubt. I mean, a couple, young couple gets married, everything is great, you know, they're together um, for a year or so, and then, you know, let's say it's the guy, and he says, you know, I'm, I think, you know, let's start a family. Uh, you know, I've always, you know, I grew up and I was just a kid, I was an only child, and I always wanted a family, and blah, 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 and she says, Family? Kid? No, I, I don't want children. Huh? <laughs> no, I, 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 don't, you know, I don't think I'm ready for children. Well, when will you be ready? I don't know. If 
Five, six years maybe? Five, six years? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm not even making this up. I'm not even making it up. Five, six years? You know, and I know all of you are thinking, shouldn't they have kind of discussed this before the, I said, I do? But people don't, they, they're in love. They, let's just get married. You know, they don't think about those things. And, and in the end, you know, when you talk to that particular young woman, it may not be, uh, it may not you know, be birthing that she's afraid of, you know, like I'm afraid it'll hurt. It may, that may not be that at all. She may be afraid of having a child and being burdened with a child and, and losing some, a, a measure of her independence and having to rely on him. It's not that she doesn't want children, it's that she's afraid that if she has a child or two and all of a sudden she's got to depend on him because she's stuck with these little kids, He's not going to be there for her. Why? Well, because he's got bowling practice three times a week. <laughs> Just, you know. Any bowlers here? I'm trying not to offend any sports people, so no bowlers, okay, good. You understand, you, you, you see what I'm saying? So the problem is not I don't love you. The problem is I'm not sure about you taking on the role that marriage has given to you, which is you're going to be a husband. Great, that's the easy part. I do, let's go for the honeymoon. The hard part is the babies come along. Are, are you ready to be father now? Are you ready to be dad? And if she's not sure that you're ready to be dad, she may not be sure she wants a baby. You know, you know how it works. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to reinforce the idea that when there's a problem in the marriage, you know, that's kind of hurting the happiness quota, the problem usually lies in the things that create the happiness. A new role, you know, the things that we've just talked about. Sometimes some physical or emotional or spiritual change in one of the partners has caused an imbalance in the relationship. All of a sudden, she, you know, just because of the, the premarital counseling she, uh, they took with the preacher has awakened her faith. Maybe before, you know, yeah, she, she grew up in the church, but you know, she'd go to church once in a while. You know, it was a thing, once in a while. But somehow marriage has, has awakened in her, her spiritual life, and all of a sudden it's become more important for her. And she starts going to church more often, and she starts reading her Bible and realizes, and she has a baby and realizes, well, I, I need God in my life. I need the Lord to help me through. And all of a sudden, she's going through this spiritual metamorphosis, you know, and growing in Christ and blah, blah, blah. But this old boy is not following along because he was like her when they started. She went once in a while, he went once in a while. You know, uh, yeah, we're Christians, sure. You know, yeah, we don't, do, we don't do bad stuff, we're good people. That was the extent of his faith. So all of a sudden her faith's starting to grow and blossom and he's still where he's at, trouble. She wants to talk about spiritual things. She wants to talk about commitment. She says, you know, can we take a week? Because we're going to Panama on a mission trip. <laughs> what? <laughs> Any bowling in Panama? Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't help the bowling thing here. It's always the same thing. It always goes back to those roles and those changes. So whatever the cause for the unhappiness, the solution can usually be found by going back to the basics of what originally created the marital happiness in the first place. Let's face it, an exclusive lifetime commitment to an imperfect person by another imperfect person is not an easy thing to accomplish. At least if one of the partners were perfect, we'd have a model. <laughs> but since both partners are imperfect, there's always trouble. Because a commitment of this sort is so challenging, couples need to make a, a, a constant effort to maintain and improve their relationship. Here's the secret. The secret that successful couples who have been happily married for a long time, this is the secret that they know. 
Uh, the secret is that marriages can and do get better with time. Unfortunately, a popular misconception today is that there is happiness in marriage, but it's only temporary and it's only at the beginning. Many people think that the best time in a marriage is at the beginning. Come on, great sex, excitement, discovery, all new adventures, you know, new house, new this, new that. Some even you know, envy the Hollywood stars who have you know, the fame and the money to repeat their honeymoon period every couple of years. So so-and-so movie star, you know, oh, Oh, Jennifer is dating so-and-so, and oh, and hey, they, they were seen holding hands at the restaurant, and da 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 and oh, gave her the big ring, the diamond, and she's on Oprah gushing about the big ring, and, and then there's the huge Hollywood wedding, and then the, you know, the tabloids, the honeymoon, and, you know, and uh, three years later, you know, oh, she was seen without her ring you know, at the beach. And you know, the Hollywood the rich people, they can call their assistants and say, you know what, just go to my house, move my stuff out into an apartment, call the lawyer and say, put the you know, divorce papers in. We're not happy anymore. I love, the, I love what they say. We love each other so deeply, but you know, we're just not happy together. And so, and we'll always be the best of friends. It seems to me that the, the, my best friend that I love so much, if you can't be married to your best friend that you love so much, who are you going to be married to? Well, basically all they're doing is repeating the honeymoon cycle over and over and over and over again. It just keeps going around. You follow that same starlet, you know, uh, give it six months, whoops. She was seen at such and such a club with so and so. You know, and here we go again. And some people actually think, that wouldn't be a bad life. Are you kidding me? This has given a lot of people the impression that when you get married, this is as good as it gets. And it only goes downhill from there. And that's wrong. That's wrong. We need to understand that marriages by design must improve from where they begin no matter how happy one feels during those first few months or years or else it'll die. That's the secret. Marriages must and can improve in order to sustain and build happiness for a lifetime. But this is what people need to understand about marriage. It has been designed in such a way that if you're not working on improving it, it begins to devolve, like everything else in the universe. It follows the same law. Some people think that you, know, you, get a free, you get a free fill up of happiness when you, when you start. You know. your, your happiness tank is full. It's like when you buy a new car and if they're nice to you, they start you off with a full tank. Well, marriage is like that. You get a full tank when you first get married. Some people think they can drive their whole life on that one tank that they got at the beginning, but it doesn't work that way. You have to continually keep filling the tank in order for the marriage to keep going and improving, and improving. So marriages must and can improve in order to sustain and build happiness for a lifetime. When this happens, then an exclusive lifetime commitment becomes a joy, not a burden. I hear people talk about lifetime commitment in marriage and, and they go, your whole life you're married to the same person? I'm going to be having sex with the same person my whole life? Yep. That's not going to be a burden. That's going to be a joy. But when you're 25, you can't see it. 
You can't see it when you're 25. But when you're 75, yeah, you can see it when you're 75. So in the next session, therefore, I'm going to share four things to work on in order to improve and create happiness in marriage. In other words, four things that you need to do to keep filling the tank. And if you keep filling the tank with these four things, you will be happy. You can be happy. You can produce happiness that'll keep you going in a happy marriage for life. Okay, we're going to stop there this week. We're going to keep going next week. All right, thank you very much for your attention.